Bodybuilders have always been pioneers, pushing the limits of physical development, and the inevitable chemical evolution of competitive bodybuilding's clearly delineated lineage can be charted across the preceding decades. The first generation of bodybuilders from the 40s and 50s represented what competitors might hope to achieve through targeted diet and exercise. Hard work, dedication, and the right combination of genetics dictated that cream's rise to the top. Steve Reeves embodied the earlier ideals of a classical aesthetic. Broad shoulders, a muscular and defined body, a small waist, and the V-taper emphasising proportional shape and symmetry over sheer size. Standards abruptly shifted with the earlier Mr. Olympia winners. A greater emphasis on mass relegated the nostalgic ideals of Reeves competitively obsolete. These guinea pigs of the Dianabol golden era, larger but smooth, included a young up-and-coming Austrian oak, who famed trainer Vince Gironda initially labelled as a fat fuck for his slightly bloated but otherworldly proportions. By the end of the Dianabol decade, the ever-adaptable Schwarzenegger ushered in a new standard for freaky size, combined with a level of definition, putting in the rear vision mirror that raw and puffy earlier version of a younger Arnold who stepped onto US shores in 1968. After its release in 1958, Dianabol became the first of many anabolics to hit the domestic market, in haphazard succession and quickly finding their way onto Olympic regimens, professional team sports, high school locker rooms, and the country's handful of hardcore gyms. Powerlifters ironically sported shirts advertising that media label denigration, Dianabol, the breakfast of champions. Olympic weightlifter Ken Patera informed reporters that an upcoming competition against Soviet Vasily Alexov would determine whose steroids are better, his or mine. Another pro baseballer stated, We didn't get beat, we got out milligrammed. Sports had become big business, and ever larger, faster, stronger players were in demand. The use or lose benchmark set a clear message to aspiring athletes that these drugs worked despite the counterclaims of the contrarian scientific community. Ergogenic science was still in its infancy, and the juice yielded in months what the otherwise futile squeeze of years of genetic limiting effort could never replicate. Even after the official censure and the public contempt aimed accusingly at pro sports, the underground experimentation of performance enhancement continued to develop unabated. PEDs offered first and foremost transcendence, and it was in the strength training and bodybuilding communities that steroid use became most widespread. There's an irony that while the wild world of sports is subject to vilification towards PED use, bodybuilding remained in a league of its own. In short, steroids didn't just create bodybuilding. Bodybuilding's both the poster child and the official sport of the steroid lifestyle. The progression of its most dominant superhuman physiques continues to offer clear evidence of how drugs shape bodybuilding and not the other way around. As Joe Weider once remarked, A champion is interested in one thing only, to win. And what does he do to win? Everything he possibly can. To expect anything different is to be naive. Reaping the dramatic shift in financial rewards brought on by the 70s and 80s fitness era boom, Weeder cannily changed the masthead of his leading magazine from muscle builder to muscle and fitness. Criticised for his shadowy promotion of steroid-based bodybuilding, obfuscated by his promotion of pro-bodybuilder-endorsed snake oil supplements, Weeder replied, how could I tell who was using steroids or not? Trainer of champions indeed. It was Weeder's connections with friendly doctors that provided athletes with their unofficial and off-the-record supplementation programs. As bodybuilder Rick Drayson remarked, We'd go to see this pediatrician on Hollywood Boulevard. One side of the waiting room was pregnant mothers and kids. The other side was bodybuilders. Pediatrician Walter Jekot played a pivotal part in the Californian steroid supply chain for the next two decades until he was indicted by a grand jury on 27 felony counts of distributing anabolic steroids and HGH. Printed flyers for Jekot's steroid services clearly stated, Bodybuilders, for each new patient you refer to our office, you will receive one of the following. One, either six free Deco 50mg injections or three 
free deck of 100 milligram injections. Playing his part as middleman for the largest steroid distribution ring in US history, Jekot was convicted in 1989 and sentenced to five years prison. Ignoring the fact that Jekot also played a crucial role in saving thousands of lives afflicted with HIV, he pioneered the use of steroids to AIDS patients since the early 80s, and Jekot's conviction proved a useful scapegoat in scaring other doctors away from prescribing steroids. Jekot, who himself was gay, was speculated to be the doctor that Steve McCallick referred to as Dr. X. According to Steve, this doctor had been prescribing steroids to bodybuilders for over two decades and had a lock on all the good shit like primabolin and parabolin. Steve asserted that aspiring bodybuilders had to quickly learn that the road to the title went through that doctor's office, and if he didn't put out for him, they weren't accessing that competitive size. Dr. X showed Steve pictures of five former champions that already paid that asking price, and so McCallick brokered a deal, acting as would-be pimp and go-between, directing other guys through the good doctor's office. Indicative of this use-one, use-them-all mindset, bodybuilders supplemented these medically prescribed doses with trips to their Mexican connections, crossing the border, stocking up, and returning with what Eddie Giuliani referred to as a trunk full of shit. Casey Viator openly reported that these mild cycles of the golden era were more fiction than fact. Don't let anyone fool you about our low doses. We were just as reckless with steroid uses as they are today. The big doses started around 1974, and yes, we were all right on top of it. Yes, we all used growth hormone back then, and it was from real cadavers. The GH we all used was called Cress Corman, and nobody was going to the morgues to get it. Bodybuilding chiropractor and writer Dick Tyler reported the effects of this rising abuse. Some of the guys would come in complaining to me that they'd taken so many steroids that their nose would bleed. They'd develop tumours in their bodies, things like that. But if a guy was smart... He'd have a time when he needed to put on a little extra strength, and Arnold was one that I think skated that very fine balance. Pumping Irons Robbie Robinson describes how Weeder set him up with one of his doctors when he was put on a regimen of 200 milligrams of Deca, B12, and calcium injected once every two weeks. When I first started training with Arnold, I didn't know steroids even existed. Nobody brought it up to me. I heard words like d and Primo around the gym, but I knew they would never say anything to me about them. Two weeks before the Mr. World's competition, an older guy at the gym asked me what I was taking, and I said nothing. And so he gave me what I think was 100 milligrams of Durabolin 50 or Primabolin. I immediately went home, and as I sat in my chair, my head started to spin, and I thought, oh my god, what's happening? My body was changing before my eyes. Muscles were filling out, looking as if they were swollen. It was as if my 18 years of weight training had compressed my muscles so much that they now had the room to breathe. At that moment, the ground started to shake underneath me. Ironically, I was experiencing my first earthquake. The jolting ground literally bounced my chair with me on it clear across the floor. And when I next went to the gym, I felt stronger and even more solid. I was more assured and confident under even heavy weights. Once he received that weeder connection, he was in the gang, so to speak, and the guys openly discussed their PD use with him. Many headed to Mexico regularly to supplement what they received from the doctor. Robbie reported that most guys became year-round human lab racket experiments conducting their own self-prescribed chemistry, primabolin, DECA, testosterone, Winstrol V, Dianabol, GH, Cytomel and Clenbuterol became standard use for gaining size and cutting. Outside the purview of Weider's oversight, the French residing IFBB vice president of the time, Serge Nubray, flip-flopped between emissions of PED use and claiming a dubious lifetime natural status. While extremely impressive as a teenager, Serge strains the limits of credulity professing to build his 20-inch arms without the use of PEDs. In the book Reps, Serge states, Drugs help some champions over sticking points in their training, but there's no proof whatsoever 
that the boost had not been altogether psychological. Along with his claimed one meal per day horse meat and water diet, Serge used an unconventional grab bag of pharmaceuticals different to those on the anabolic menu in the US. Serge favoured French manufactured Parabolin by Negma Labs. Also known as Tren Hex, it was used primarily for enhancing weight gain and feed efficiency in livestock. Eventually pulled from the market, Parabolin made a large impact among bodybuilders, who typically use 76 milligrams twice per week, according to Dan Duchesne in his Underground Steroid Handbook. Another French favourite was Trifobaline, an odd drug that also gained short-time traction in the US. Trifobaline combined a small amount of DECA with added progesterone to combat its masculizing side effects and stimulate appetite. But Duchesne questioned the efficacy of this drug due to its associated water and fat retention, as well as its potential for gyno among users. Surge was also said to use a liquid amino acid called trofycin, and a lower dose equivalent of Cytomel T3 called Treacana and Thiamacase cream, mixed and rubbed into the belly and the thighs to burn subcutaneous fat. Another product widely used in the last few weeks of competition was called Percatacrine, a kind of ampule with around 6 mils of some liquid claimed to heat up and burn fat under the skin. Once a week, Serge and friends posed under artificial lights in his gym, and if a bit behind schedule would use two triacana per day and elastics at night to get rid of all the water. Surge was also rumoured to have used something called isamaride, a form of methamphetamine that would have aided Nubray's marathon length gym sessions and satiety, but I couldn't find out too much about this compound. From 1966 to 1984, one of the most prominent doctors used was former Marine and physician Dr. Robert Kerr claiming to have treated more than 10,000 athletes, bodybuilders, weightlifters and Hollywood stars from 20 countries with PEDs from the local to the Olympic level, Kerr was a beacon in the uncharted waters of PED use. Self-taught in the ergogenic application of this new pharmacology, his book entitled The Practical Use of Anabolic Steroids with Athletes is one of the first manifestos aimed at safe dosing with harm minimization. Kerr's book is a fascinating window into the recommended stacks and mindset for PED usage throughout the golden era. You can read firsthand why the guys preferred using anabolics while minimizing testosterone usage. It also has some interesting stories like powerlifters using 1500 5 mg dianabol tablets per day and also taking full bottles of Anavar and 40 to 50 Anadrol per day. Kerr was a regular at local gyms and seeing members trade black market drugs began prescribing PEDs for athletes in 1966. Kerr became a rebel with a cause as one of the first physicians to advocate for medically monitored use of PEDs and he openly discussed his exploits with journalists. Kerr argued for harm minimization, prescribing low doses and health screening athletes regardless of the public medical or legal ramifications. While some viewed Kerr as a cloak and dagger enabler, one who made unfounded claims to justify his methods in gaining notoriety, trading off his patients' health for fame and fortune, the San Gabriel-based Kerr was instrumental in popularising human growth hormone in the dawn of the 1980s. Telling ABC World News Tonight that growth hormone had been all the rage among track and field athletes, he mentioned how GH surpassed anabolic steroids as the drug of choice for strength and muscle building. The real athletes aren't taking steroids. The elite Olympic athletes laugh at this, Kerr stated. They say I haven't taken testosterone in a year, but I take GH. Kerr explained that patients preferred growth hormone because of its permanency effect. The ability to retain strength and size gains long after completing a course of treatment. Steroids and testosterone likewise enhance athletic ability, Kerr noted, but didn't elicit that same permanency effect as GH. Kerr observed that growth hormone wasn't just a superior anabolic, but had the side benefit of increasing height in a percentage of its users. This runs totally counter to Duchesne's report of GH in his underground steroid handbook, dismissing his former praise for the drug and labelling it overpriced and bizarrely overhyped. Most top athletes get zero results from it, 
and try it simply out of insecurity that their competitors are also using it, was Duchesne's evaluation. No athletes got bigger or stronger or leaner while using just HGH. They just got poorer. Of course, many athletes have used HGH in conjunction with anabolic steroids and did get some results, but it was from the steroid use, not the growth hormone. I know I won't be able to convince some of you that using HGH is a worthless endeavor. After a number of doping scandals, lawsuits, and malpractice allegations, Kerr began to reverse his opinion on assisting athletes and ceased prescribing PEDs in 1986, claiming, At one time I felt that if a physician could evaluate athletes who desired to take anabolic substances, there would be no need to go to the black market. But this simply isn't the case. Many of the athletes will have their prescriptions filled at the drugstore and then visit their local dealer just to see what drugs can be supplemented. They take what I prescribe and supplement it with five or six other things. I've changed my mind. You can't trust athletes. Kerr not only stopped prescribing PEDs after the scandals of the Los Angeles Olympics, he became an informant and expert witness for the anti-doping movement, providing testimony and in government inquests into drug use in sports. In his doping memoir, Drug, Sport and Politics, Kerr galvanised politicians in the pursuit of more stringent anabolic steroid laws, eventually leading to the enactment of the Anabolic Steroids Control Act of 1990. The 1980s soared to some of its greatest heights and bodybuilding would witness further changes in its modalities of exercise, diet and drugs. With the exit of the old guard and the introduction of a 245-pound Lee Haney, it appeared that bodybuilding had hit an endpoint of human muscular development. Labelled by some as Arnold 2.0, many would go on to ask how much further this transgressive and avant-garde activity could go. The indulgence of enormous dosages of substances, the consequence of which couldn't be known, exemplified one of bodybuilding's most freakish characteristics, its drive towards self-destruction. In the next part of this series, I will dive further into some of the more reckless examples of guys tangentially associated with the pumping iron era. As always, I would appreciate the support of a thumbs up or a comment, or if you find value and wish to support my efforts with a super like or a donation, please check out the links in the description below, and make sure to subscribe to the channel for more bodybuilding news, truths and reviews. Thanks for watching.